first uh, Asia Connect webinar series in topic with education. Uh, sorry for a delay a bit. So we had some uh, technical problems. Uh, the, my name is uh, Eunjin Ha, MC for today's webinar. This webinar series is initiated by Asia Connect Project, which is co-funded by the European Union and Asia Connect Partners. Since last year, 2020, we have been faced many challenges in our daily life due to COVID-19. However, our research and education communities have wisely overcome this situation and continues to collaborate across the border. This webinar series is a virtual place to share Asia Connect Call for Proposals activities and its achievement. Today's program consists of two sessions. The first session is an information sharing about the project and activities. And the second session is a panel discussion. Before we start the program, I would like to invite Mr. Luis Hyano Choi for the opening remarks. He is the executive officer of Tensa CC and the project manager of Asia Connect project. Mr. Luis Hiano Choi, screen is yours. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, distinguished participants, and good afternoon in Asia and good morning in Europe. Uh, my name is Luis Hiano Choi, uh, Executive Officer of the Ten Star Cooperation Center. First of all, I'd like to thank you for attending uh, today's Asia Connect webinar meeting. Uh, it, it is a series meeting then. So uh, before, uh, before today's uh, webinar meeting then, so how are you with the corona pandemic situation? Just terrible. So although the, the pandemic situation is improving worldwide, uh, but we are still facing many uh, difficulties and challenges due to the new mutations, such as uh, these days the Omicron, we call, is very uh, serious situation today. I hope that the safety of all participants uh, from the threat of this kind of mutations, I think that, I emphasize that, this is top priority for everyone, okay? Today's Asia Connect webinar series is a multi-event uh, for info sharing about the Asia Connect activities. Asia Connect uh, already selected uh, 67 programs via our call for proposal program in Asia Connect project, and more than 6,000 programs of uh, people, 6,000 people in this uh, region benefited from these programs. Uh, it's very uh, unique uh, uh, opportunity uh, to get the uh, experience for Use, it, uh, use of our network and uh, our activities. To share uh, this successful result, uh, we prepared this webinar series. Uh, as the first round today, we picked the topic about education. E-education is very important uh, with unpredict uh, unpredicted COVID-19 pandemic our daily life has been totally changed, totally some dangerous then. And the internet connectivity become uh, more important than ever. It's very important, especially internet connectivity, such as our TAIN network, has contributed a lot in educational part. Is very top priority of usage of our uh, sustainable connectivity is a network. 
but it is the real thing that you say. Asia Connect also continues the trainings and uh, research collaborations uh, via online education, just to record in the e-learning, e-education uh, is, is the similar meaning that. And today, uh, through difficult programs, we will share how they work together using the network and what are achievements that is very important point. Uh, for today's webinar, uh, the uh, four experts are invited here. A uh, very thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to express uh, my gratitude to uh, Douglas Hare uh, from New Zealand, the moderator of this today's webinar. Thank you, and uh, Wata Chi, the professor of the University of Saints Malaysia. Uh, thank you very much too. And uh, Tawi, uh, Muhammad Tawi, the DCO of the BDN of Bangladesh. So thank you very much too. And uh, finally, so our uh, Francis Ri Husong is the professor of uh, Nanyang Technology University, Singapore. And uh, especially thank you very much, the chair of our Tain Star CC Advisory Board is very important person too. And so I hope uh, this event uh, will share our community's creative idea and uh, make a foundation uh, for better Asia Connect project. And then we can get more information and we can get more valuable idea to make beyond Asia Connect. Uh, we 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 can we can do it. We have to uh, make the next uh, page of the Asia Connected Two. Just so we call the Asia Connected Two. Uh, just so we can make that all together. We need uh, we need uh, get more valuable information from us. Everyone, be careful of COVID nineteen pandemic still going on and uh, stay healthy. Uh, thank you very much and uh, enjoy today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. He stressed the importance of uh, RNA network on education in this uh, COVID-19 pandemic and roles of our communities using RNA network. Now, let's open the first session I would like to invite Mr. Douglas Hare, the session moderator of this webinar. He was a former deputy chair of Asia Connect Steering Committee and the governor of New Zealand. Mr. Douglas, the screen is yours. Okay, thank you for the introduction and uh, welcome to you also, Lewis. Thank you, nice to see you again also. <clears throat> Uh, so good afternoon to everybody, uh, good evening to people, and good morning, depending on where you are in the world, uh, to all of you across the region. Uh, today's webinar, as Lewis, nice to see you again also. <clears throat> uh, so good afternoon to everybody, uh, good evening to people, and good morning, depending on where you are in the world, uh, to all of you across the region. Uh, today's webinar, as Lewis has said, is the first in a series that we'll be running over the next few months, covering different topics. Uh, the aim is to give the wider NREN community more information about the projects. Uh, as Lewis said, there's been about 67 projects that have been funded, and these webinars will, over time, provide a cross-section of information uh, for people to look at. So we have three speakers today, each of whom have been the PI for their particular project. Uh, the format today is that each of the speakers will talk for 25 minutes or so, no longer than 25 minutes. And uh, then uh, at the end, there will be a panel session for the last um, 25 or 30 minutes, and then we'll wrap things up. So our first speaker today is Professor Wan Tat Chi. Um, from University of Saints Malaysia. 
Uh, Professor Wen Tat Chi received his bachelor's and master's degree from the University of Miami in Florida and his PhD from his university in Malaysia. He's the associate professor with the School of Computer Sciences and the deputy director for the IP version 6 center. He will be speaking on the very important topic of uh, network defense, which everybody who's working in the NREN area will be very interested in. So, Professor Tachi Wan, the floor is yours. Yes, yes, we can. Okay, great. Yes. Thank you. Sorry about the delay. So, on behalf of the uh, University of Science Malaysia, I'd like to welcome you to this webinar. And uh, as a brief introduction, this project is called Distributed and Cloud-Based Network Defense System for NRENs. And we have actually a co-PI for this project from Boet, which is uh, Prof. Muhammad Saifu Islam. And this project was actually started in June of eight, uh, 2018 and uh, supposed to end in May 2020, although uh, unfortunately due to COVID, uh, it was extended and we finally uh, completed the project in end of February 2021. So the beneficiary countries of this project were Malaysia, Bangladesh, Indonesia and the Philippines with two EU partners. One is the first is Fiveware Foundation from France. Secondly, is the University of Hamburg in Germany. So the, this project actually consists of two components, but the, just to highlight here, the capacity building activities in this uh, project were two series of workshops and stakeholder dialogues. The first one on cloud-based web security, best practices and system configuration. And the second on uh, botnet mitigation, best practices and system evaluation. So as a background to why we have this project, the, the, one of the recent, you know, over the years, we find that there's increasing network threats to the NRENs. Uh, first of all, there are web security compromises, which uh, also affect uh, not just the uh, research network, but also the commodity networks. And secondly, the rise of distributed botnets. So we have a lack of trained NREN and research personnel in these areas. So we believe that the capacity building workshops conducted in beneficiary countries is important and vital for increasing the ability of NREN research and research personnel in dealing with such threats. And secondly, we also find that there are lack of services and tools for dealing with emerging threats, especially in terms of uh, distributed botnets, which uh, is one of the focus of the uh, project uh, in terms of developing and evaluating tools for addressing these issues. So the first uh, part of the uh, tool that we are focusing on is cloud-based security solutions. And secondly, is tools for uh, addressing distributed botnets. And as mentioned earlier, the participating, participating countries are listed as below. So on the slide here, we notice that there is a trend, increasing trend of uh, distributed botnets due to the increased use of Internet of Things devices. And these devices, once they are deployed, tend to be unpatched and uh, do not have uh, software updates applied to them. So over time, their vulnerability in their code has made it very susceptible to being infected with botnets. So as I mentioned at the beginning, we have two series of capacity building workshops. And also, secondly, the, the second component of this project is to uh, come up with distributed and cloud-based network defense system. Firstly, something called cloud-enabled security system for BDRAN, which is used to manage web security for participating institutions in Bangladesh. The second uh, component of this uh, second uh, objective is to develop a botnet detection system for project partners. So the botnet detection system uh, works differently from the, uh, the usual in the sense that we will use data that is monitored and collected from various partner NRENs in order to uh, provide a more comprehensive detection and analysis in order to uh, determine the activity of distributed botnets, which tend to be difficult to trace. So as an outcome of this, uh, data analytics and detection uh, implemented on the Fireware Cloud system hosted at the USM in MyRen. And secondly, security dashboards are provided for the NREN partners for them to track the behavior and the activity of botnets in their own network. 
And finally, we also have published a research data set for reference and has been hosted on zenodo.org, the Open Science uh, Repository. I'll provide some of this information later. So firstly, as an overview of the capacity building workshops, we did this, uh, these workshops in each individual countries that were part of the, uh, the, part of the partners of this project in Malaysia, Bangladesh, Indonesia, and Philippines. So out of this, we, of the two series of workshops, we have managed to train over uh, 240 uh, NREN and uh, academic research personnel. And we believe that this approach of having uh, workshops in individual countries uh, is a much more uh, cost effective as well as being able to reach additional uh, participants who may have difficulty acquiring funding to attend overseas uh, training. Uh, that was, of course, before COVID. So uh, in terms of, just to highlight, uh, for the Philippines, the original workshop was planned for March of 2020. But however, due to the outbreak of uh, COVID uh, restrictions and lockdowns, it was delayed and eventually was conducted successfully uh, through an online webinar format uh, in November. So this is the uh, architecture for the DCNDS uh, network. We have the various partner NRANs as well as the uh, University of Hamburg uh, connected through the TN network to provide us with uh, advice and, and, and help developing the algorithms used in the uh, botnet detection. And uh, the actual, uh, okay, so let's start talking about the CSS. CSS was uh, adopted for BDRAN. Uh, under BUET to investigate the security uh, or providing web security as a service uh, proof of concept. So it was deployed and uh, was able to be implemented successfully in BDRAN uh, for the duration of the project. Secondly, the distributed botnet monitoring nodes were deployed in the various uh, research networks and the at each of the NOCs, there are uh, packet capture as well as uh, analytics servers used to collect the data regarding the botnet activity. And these uh, summarized uh, information, which are also anonymized to protect the uh, respective uh, users and hosts of the NREN, are uh, then forwarded to the central uh, to the Fireware cloud server to provide the overall statistics and analytics uh, dashboards. Uh, as the first overview, the CSS architecture for BDRAN is a cloud-enabled uh, security service. The intention is to provide each uh, participating organization a, a, cent a web or a virtualized uh, security platform for controlling and uh, managing the access of the internet uh, resources. Uh, these are the, uh, this is a cloud-based platform. It is actually a uh, security appliance uh, from Cisco running on a VMware uh, ESXi uh, platform. Uh, and this is some of the traces that were collected during the month of October 2019 in terms of the uh, activity where we have detected uh, various uh, suspicious or malicious traffic, some of which were blocked, as you seen in the, the graph in red, and, uh, and the rest are clean and uh, legitimate uh, traffic. So in addition, there are also malware detected uh, by the system, which allows us to determine the uh, level activity of various type of uh, web-based malware uh, in the network. And uh, the, this is another view of the, of the malware detection statistics uh, provided over time. So generally we find that uh, setting up the system was not easy. It took several months to get the system up and running because uh, the there's a rather complex uh, software it has to integrate into the network infrastructure. And initially, the plan was to pass network traffic to CSS in transparent mode, where the all the traffic to each given uh, participant participating institution are uh, filtered through the CSS system. 
However, uh, due to some technical limitations, it was not possible to implement transparent mode in the, the switches. So uh, instead, it was uh, limited to capturing uh, data to some VDN servers in uh, specific VLANs. So uh, in general, I, I think the issue here is, the, is one of the, uh, the, the challenge of a cloud-based security platform was that uh, we can provide protection, but to provide it as to the overall uh, institution uh, through, a, through the switches and through the routers will be uh, quite challenging. Uh, now going on to DBDS. Uh, DBDS is a collection of uh, several components, as you see in the graph uh, diagram below. There's a flow capture server, which is interfaced to the switches in the NREN, which will uh, capture the, the net using NetFlow to capture the uh, data transmission. And the packet headers will then be passed through the data analytics to detect uh, unusual and uh, bot uh, and suspicious uh, traffic trends, which is used by P2P botnet traffic. So after the data analytics was, has been done at the, each particular uh, partner site, the data is also further anonymized so that uh, only the summary data will be passed to the uh, Fiverr platform uh, cloud server where the visualization dashboard is uh, hosted. So each partner in uh, RAN in this project deployed the component capture, uh, components to capture the flows, analyze and send the anonymous results to a centralized Fiverr server from which data is visualized through the dashboard. Uh, this is another uh, data flow in, uh, diagram showing how the data is transmitted. It starts off from the network through it going through the edge router, which is mirrored through a port to be passed to the flow capture server. So this is a 10 gigabit per second uh, network interface to be able to handle the amount of traffic that is expected through to be mirrored uh, using that flow. And after which the NetFlow uh, captured data is then passed to the data analytics server, which runs enhanced peer hunter software in order to uh, detect the botnet uh, uh, activity. And the results of this would then be forwarded to the Fiverr server for collection and, uh, and, and uh, summary so that it can be displayed on a dashboard for the participant, uh, uh, participating institution uh, network uh, managers. So this is a quick overview of the type of uh, dashboard uh, statistics that we can observe. On the top left here, this is the uh, activity behavior. And in the bottom left, we have some anonymized uh, information about the specific hosts or various hosts that are active as potential botnets. Uh, these are all suspicious notes because uh, these are the first level. We have identified the distributed botnet activity, but uh, without going into or uh, knowing whether it is a, a known uh, botnet, it would not be possible to um, give further information. Now, the purpose of this system is also to identify unknown or zero day botnet attacks uh, as they occur, right? So the hash here is obviously uh, based on the uh, original packet header, but they are hashed in order to provide anonymized information so that the user or the researcher does not know exactly where or what is the IP address of the uh, suspected node. On the top right, we have uh, another graph view of the, of the data and the bottom uh, right is a heat map uh, showing some of the uh, most recent uh, suspected uh, botnet uh, nodes in, as a hashed uh, identifier. Right, so uh, this is a quick summary of the deployment status of DBDS. All the hardware and software has been set up in the four participating partner sites. However, only two sites are actively generating and forwarding data. So we have tried to troubleshoot the data collection and uh, forwarding process at BDRAN and Preginet, but however, uh, the process is rather difficult, which I'll explain uh, later in the summary. And so uh, that's why in the 
uh, previous uh, slide, we only see the statistics for two sites uh, shown on that diagram. Uh, in summary, uh, we have successfully deployed all, uh, the components, hardware and software, all part time locations. They were tested and were seen to be operational. However, the uh, forwarding of the data through the, the EN uh, network to the various uh, to the fiveware cluster was not uh, working properly. We still do not uh, have not had the opportunity to troubleshoot it in full uh, due to the various uh, challenges. Uh, but in any case, we would like to acknowledge uh, all the effort and uh, and contribution by ST. Uh, University of Brawijaya, Bangladesh University of Engineering and Technology or BUET, University of Hamburg and Fiverr Foundation for their support and efforts to uh, make this uh, system uh, functional. In addition, of course, uh, USM has their uh, in, uh, staff and personnel who help set up the system as well. So out of this project, we managed to collect uh, some uh, botnet uh, data traffic data and it has been published on Zenodo. The traffic uh, covers a span of one month from June 19 to July 19 of 2021 and uh, is available for use by other researchers if uh, you are interested in uh, what distributed botnet the activity and their behavior. So some of the lessons learned uh, we believe that the in-country capacity building is able to attract more local participants of course, this is pre-COVID, so uh, today the focus may be or the approach may be slightly different, but a lot of these kind of training requires some hands-on component, which is I, still rather difficult for uh, remote participants to be able to um, take on and, and uh, achieve the, the, the same level of understanding and, and uh, discussion among the participants as compared to a in-person training. So the advantage of having an in-country capacity building is that many participants who do not have the opportunity to attend centralized training in another country due to funding issues now are much are able to uh, receive their training uh, because of course uh, within the country there usually the institutions are more willing to fund travel in country than to fund travel outside of their own country uh, due to the cost. Secondly, the onset of COVID lockdowns affected the last workshop scheduled for the Philippines. And so we, but we managed to successfully conduct it in November 2020 as a webinar format. But it is not easy to conduct hands-on training, as I mentioned. So I, I don't know if there is a good solution for this. But uh, that is one of the challenges for going forward. And the lastly, the extended COVID lockdowns affected the development of DBDS. And it's difficult to continue software development as no campus access. So the campuses, at least in Malaysia, were uh, close to students and staff. So uh, we were not able to access our labs or the equipment easily. And a lot of times to coordinate the access requires uh, different staff from different departments to be present. So uh, it was a challenge for us, right? But we did manage to uh, finally finish up the system and it was deployed to partners in February of 2021. And it's been operational since March of 2021. And as mentioned earlier, the local packet capture and first level analytics is running properly. However, the anonymized, anonymized data feed to fireware is only working for Malaysia and Indonesia sites. Uh, then secondly, the deployment and testing of packet capture nodes in partner and other sites need in-person attention. Uh, so uh, when during, especially during the peak of the lockdown, uh, it was difficult to arrange for a suitable time on both ends because uh, for the as USM as the develop, uh, software development uh, focus, we need to be present and to at least to be online to be able to communicate with the, the staff that is doing the uh, testing in the NREN itself. And uh, usually also we found that coordination and communication is very slow due to weak offsite internet access for many partners. So the NREN may be working and functional at the, the, uh, at the connected locations, but most of the time during the lockdown, uh, people are asked to 
return to their homes or wherever they, they may be, but not on campus. And contacting people in that environment is quite a challenge. Okay, so uh, to summarize, training materials and research data sets, they are both available online for uh, interested parties. You can go through to dcnds.asia, that's the main website for this project. You can access the training session videos for the each uh, respective uh, workshop. So there are altogether eight different training uh, workshops, I mean, four of each series. So, um, well, I guess you can have a, a spot for choice in which workshop to, uh, to participate or to review. And the presentation slides also are available. And if you're interested in the research data set for the botnet activity traces, it's available from Zenodo. You can use the link I gave here from the dcnds.asia website to access it. Otherwise, uh, you can also search for it on Zenodo, though I think it may not be so uh, easy to find because there's a lot of uh, different data sets on, on that system. So using this link, you can uh, connect to that Zenodo um, page uh, quickly. Right, so finally, the contact information, myself and uh, Professor Muhammad Saifu Islam, who is the other co-PI for BUET, who is uh, in, involved with the CSS uh, component, as well as the training uh, of, uh, of conducting of the training uh, together with us and uh, uh, EU partners. Okay, thank you. Excellent, and thank you for that. And you finished five minutes early, which must be the first in the history of anybody doing a presentation. So excellent. <laughs> thank you very much. We will go back to uh, your talk at the end when we have the panel session. So thank you very much indeed. Okay, our next speaker is uh, Mohammed Torit, the CEO of BD Ren. I'm the CEO of BD Ren in the uh, middle of 2019. So he's going to be talking about the project that they've been doing on distance learning using Zoom. So without any further ado, Torit, I will hand over to you. Thank you, Hari. Let me share my screen. You have 25 minutes also. I should get 30 because the first presenter taken five minutes less. Is my screen visible? That's good. I can see you and hear you. So thank you for that. Oh, okay. The floor is the floor is yours, Torrit. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Douglas. So let me start. So uh Good afternoon, good morning, whoever, where, uh, from mostly from Asia Pacific region. My topic is achievements, sustainability, and way forward. I am presenting facilitating distance learning using digital conferencing facility. That is the project we were awarded with by Tenster CC under Asia Connect Financing, under CFP2 in work package five. So before starting my presentation, a note of apologies for the audience, because the project became so successful and it was so widely acclaimed that I had to present it in many different forums. And it is very difficult for me to instill new stuff into it. So that's why for some of the audience, it might be some of the slides might be a boring repetition of the previous one. So I'm really sorry for that. I seek your sincere apology. So the project was initiated by two of the great visionaries, my ex-CEO, my predecessor, AKM Habibur Rahman, who was the sponsoring principal investigator, and ex CEO of Nordonet, Renebach, who was co principal investigator of this project. 
two excellent personalities and two excellent visionaries. And it was supported by the collaborating participants, Eric Kickenberg from Nordnet and six others from six beneficiary countries. The role of each and every person was equally important for the grand success of this project. I salute all of them. Then this is the project team, me as the leader, as principal investigator, Mr. Jaidul Islam and Ibrahim Khandukar was my co-staff. The project deliverables, a few of the deliverables, I have tried to present it here, but believe me, all those deliverables could be achieved and many more could be achieved. So as I proceed through my presentation, probably all these things will be clear to you. In brief, the project, if we look at the horizontal side, the project was extended two times. First in April 2020, the initial project period was from September 2018 to April 2020. But due to wide success of the project, it was first extended till December 2020. Then it was extended again second times till June 2021. In total, if we look at the particle side, 23 activities were there, six were DLE. The DLE stands for distance learning and education. Five were digital seminars, including DigiNurse and DigiTox. And two train the trainers program, followed by four train the trainees program. And some of the awareness build-up workshop and performance evaluation workshop. That was the brief of 23 activities. What were the achievements? In terms of daily courses, if we look at the statistics, total number of registrants were around 3,000. The distribution is given at the right side. The point to note is only 13% could become successful. So first, it struck me like anything, why 13%? But later on, when we tried to identify the root cause, it was found that since we declared some sort of award for the top standing participants, many of the participants joined without knowing the details or without uh, knowing whether they will be able to cope up with the training topics. But eventually, they got dropped out and only 13% could become successful. So that is quite understandable why the success rate is not that much satisfactory. So if we look at the digital seminars and digital talk shows, this was mostly arranged for the network professionals of the entrance, total around 400 participants in five digital seminars. If we look at the train the trainers and train the trainees program, actually there were two train the trainers program. One took place in Sri Lanka and the other one was in Kathmandu, Nepal. And it was, they were followed by four train the trainees program in four of the beneficiary countries. Actually, we shaped it in a way that the trainers who will be trained in the train the trainer program will work as a trainer for the train the trainees program. So it was kind of chain effect and it worked like anything. So in aggregate, total female percentage of participants were 15%, male were 85% from 13 countries, you can see that even beyond the beneficiary countries, many of the participants took part in the training program. It was led by Bangladesh as host country, around 2,500, and followed by Nepal and Sri Lanka. Then came the deadly pandemic. These are the events. I will explain it later, so I won't take much time explaining this slide. Actually, the pandemic for most of the Asian countries or South Asian countries, 
It stroke around the beginning of March and we started our Zoom service on production mode in at the end of the March. Then Nordnet approved the production mode to go ahead with the production mode in the month of May. Then in June, we could, sorry. Soon we could get some additional licenses from Nordonet. The project was extended for the second time in December 2020. Then in July, that means at the end of the expiry of the project, we got the commitment, we got the assurance from Nordonet that they are not going to withdraw the Zoom licenses and they will keep on continuing the service for the period till Zoom come up with any of their solution which will be uh, which will be accommodatable for the beneficiary countries in terms of cost and then the final allocation of additional licenses came from Nordunet in August 2021. Then the disastrous impact, what were the impacts? All institutions got closed, internet and research traffic plummeted and end end services were threatened. You can see from this diagram that both PDN and LAN internet traffic got plummeted. And in case of research traffic, although LAN and NREN could maintain the same amount of traffic, but for PDN and Dukren, the traffic dipped down. And what followed? The government allowed the delivery of online education and as soon as it was allowed, the institutions got crazy for getting support from the from any quarter. So as NREN, we could come forward because we had some licenses in our repository. We could immediately jump into the scene by providing Zoom services, by offering Zoom services to our honorable members. Was it without challenge? No, definitely not. What challenges did we face? First challenge came in the form of running Zoom in production mode. Then the second challenge was inadequate amount of Zoom licenses. And the third one was crunching our data center. I will explain them one by one. So this figure might not be pretty valuable for the audience, but it is a Terrible mail that I received from Nordonet CEO on 11th May, 2021. He became furious that we were consuming all the computing capacity of Nordonet data center. How? He explained it here in the table. You can see that BDRAN traffic increased 710 times. Drukran traffic increased almost 2,800 times. NREN traffic increased almost 1,127 times. Don't get confused with the decimal because they use a decimal instead of comma in the Nordic countries. So we got, we got confused what to do. We requested Rene to explain our situation and to allow us to run this service in production mode. And what followed? We requested him to meet in a meeting and we met on 13th May, actually two days after he raised the issue. And in that meeting, we could convince Rene that actually we are not consuming any of their data center capacity. The diagram that he was referring in here was the diagram of the traffic flow, not the traffic that is flowing towards the Nordonet data center. He was very much convinced with our explanation and he said sorry to us and he told us that he will let us continue the service in production mode. And not only that, he was so satisfied that he increased the number of licenses from previously allocated 7,500 to almost 2.5 times, 20,000. 
And in that allocation, LARN got most of the benefit because their licensing capacity increased almost 15 times from 500 to 7,500. But was the allocation enough? Not at least for Bidiran, because Bidiran had around 20,000 faculty members to support, but we had only allocation of 7,500 licenses. So then big invention came from the Bidiran software team. What was that? In normal Zoom traditional uses, what happens? You have to allocate each faculty member with, their account, with an account, but that faculty member is not engaged in a meeting all the time. So what happens? In the traditional uses, you have to allocate as many accounts as you have number of faculties. So the efficiency of utilization of account becomes less than 10%. But what we did, we put a scheduler box in between. So between the faculty members and Zoom application, we put a scheduler box and we started creating accounts for the faculty members in the scheduler box. And the scheduler box was given the responsibility to create the meeting. And what happened? We needed as many accounts in scheduler box as we have not, we had number of faculties and we required as many Zoom accounts as we had simultaneous number of meetings. So the efficiency rose almost to 100%. So applying that technique and utilizing that software, we could manage more than 15,000 faculty members using less than 7,000 Zoom accounts. But the on-prem users, what is the beauty of on-prem users? The beauty of on-prem users is all the meetings that are going to be created within your data center. So there is no internet traffic. All traffic will be considered as domestic traffic. So that is the beauty. But what is, what is the flip side? The flip side is your data center will start getting crunched. There, 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 the computing capacity will become strangulated because all the meetings are created in your data center. What are the solutions? Okay, fine, you can stagger some of the classes. By the, that is the way you can reduce your busy hour load or the adaptation of software that Bidiran did because Bidiran replaced all the internationally recognized virtualization VMware software with Proxmox, the open source software. And also you can rent servers, but that will cost money. So Bidiran adopted the second option. Larn went with staggering of classes and NREN rented servers initially from Nordonet and then from Bidiran. Of course, without paying any money, it was uh, donated free of cost. And as a long-term solution, yes, you can procure new servers and both LARN and Bidiran went ahead for procurement of servers and they could complete their procurement process by end of 2020. Then what were the post-COVID achievements? These are the main achievements of this project, I believe. You can see the development of traffic from 38.5 average number of monthly meetings, it rose to 106,000. This is for Bidiran. For LARN, it is depicted, depicted quite nicely here. You can see the surge in traffic against each wave that stroke Sri Lanka. Same goes with Thailand. The average number of meetings from 80 to 8,000. Same with Dukren. For Enren, it was almost 5,000 times increment. In case of webinar, there was a substantial increment, but not as that much as the number of meetings. Seven times in case of Bidiran, 
and five times in case of learn. In terms of total aggregate number of classes from period starting from March 2020 to June 2021, the expiry of the project, total 2.9 million classes were conducted with 127 million participants. In terms of average monthly meeting up to June 2021, Bitrain has had the highest number of share, 60%, followed by LEARN, 32%. In terms of monthly maximum online classes, Bitrain conducted around 138K, followed by LEARN around 120K. Now about collaboration, probably that is the biggest benefit this project could give to the beneficiary countries. The first and foremost, the collaboration and support from Nordonet. They not only allocated the committed number of licenses as per project proposal, they increased the number of licenses in two phases and the final increment became almost five to six times than their initial commitment in the project proposal. Not only that, they allowed us to continue the Zoom licensing even after expiry of the project. So that was a big support and collaboration from Nordonet. Thanks to Nordonet and thanks to Reneva. Then comes the sharing of information. Learn taught us how to configure on-prem mode of licensing. And that actually allowed us to run the services in production mode. Then the sharing of resources. We shared our hardware data center resources probably that happened for the first time in the NREN industry. We shared our data center resources with NEPLREN and also we shared our scheduler software with LARN when they needed more licenses. Exchange of information when we encounter any types of faults. Before Zoom call center response, we discuss with each other and we resolve the problem and also the collaboration in this project that led Bitrain and LARN to initiate another project in the form of NNA. You are probably aware of that fact. One of the biggest achievement that LARN could achieve, they could make the online education free. All the meetings, all the classes that were created in LARN Zoom US URL, they could make it free of course by convincing the local telecom operators. Bitrain could convince only the local telecom government operator, but the private operators, they were not convinced. Zoom as a federated service, LARN could configure Zoom application as a federated service. Bitrain could configure it, but they couldn't implement it because of some of the mixes in the delivery of services. About the financing, Total 196K was the financing, 153K was Bidirian's part, and 42K was Tenstar CC's part that involved mostly with the procurement issue. And you can see the initial allocation. The initial allocation in travel cost was 45,000. So due to pandemic, the travel cost declined and we allocated that budget to procure some of the equipments in the form of Zoom room so we could make sure that nothing in the project activities, none of the project activities could get affected by the pandemic. In terms of awareness, we developed an exclusive portal for this project. This is still available. And this is a full-fledged web portal in which all the presentation slides and even the videos of the presentations are available. So anybody can go through the, those videos and they can educate themselves. We developed an LMS portal in the second phase and the last two courses were conducted using this LMS portal. In each and every APAN meeting, we had our sessions with the sponsorship of Nordonet. In APAN 50, we had a panel discussion. In APAN 51, we had a talk show on post-COVID internet development and accessibility challenges. We used to provide award to the top standing candidates in the DLE courses. Some of the local workshops were organized to educate federated identity services 
and in Sri Lanka and also in Bangladesh. I presented one keynote paper in Bidinog, Bangladesh Network Operators Group in 2020. The acknowledgement that we received worldwide, 10 star CC case study was published in APON 48 in Malaysia. Then an article boosting education and research during COVID-19 written by Roshan and myself was placed in the ISOC blog. Nordonet created a story based on the success of BDN. Also Nordonet created a story in their blog site based on the success of LEARN. And we prepared a newsletter highlighting this project. It is available in our website. And LAN created a separate blog site highlighting the achievements of this project. Now, what is the way forward? We were very much worried about the sustainability of the project, although Nordnet is providing all sorts of supports. As a follow-up project, we have proposed one project, BTRAN, DRUKRAN, LAN, and NRAN combinedly on the development of e-learning platform for South Asian countries. You have to understand the most difficult obstacle that we faced in running the project in on-prem mode was the crunching of our data center. So in this project, we have proposed to develop distributed data center in Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Nepal, and Bhutan. And also considering the NNA report as it reported Laos and Cambodia as struggling entrants. We have tried to accommodate them with this project with allocation of 30,000 Zoom licenses for a period of next two years by Nordonet. Not only that, we have included internship program for the women students and also grooming program for women engineers. All will be sponsored by Nordonet. If we look at the financing of the project, total financing is 238K. This is without the cost of Nordonet licenses. If you take the cost, if you consider the cost, it will go up to 3 million. So I didn't consider that part. 10 star CCs part will be 149K. And the beneficiary country, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, and Nepal will pay 22,500. And rest 66K will be shared by Nordonet. Yes, there were some failures because it is part of the success. Increased utilization of TAIN. In my first slide, I, show, I showed you the deliverables. It was anticipated, but practically it didn't happen. So I am uh, still investigating the root cause, probably in my next project, when Laos and Cambodian participants will start using the distributed data center, probably we can show more utilization of the train traffic and BDN's failure in convincing the private telecom operators that will be treated as a failure, should be treated because 98% of our telecom users are related, are using the services of private operators. One final note, me on behalf of the project, I will propose for a Hall of Fame award or some kind of similar award for this illustrious personality who helped us in making the project a success, not only making the project a success, who actually helped us in stamping our footprint in the industry. Previously, we used to hanker after our member institutions. Now the member in institutions have started running after us. They are frequently requesting us how they can help us. So this has only been possible by the help and cooperation extended by this great phenomenal personality. Also, Nordonet should be given a letter of acknowledgement from Asia Connect. That is our proposal from behalf, on behalf of the project. Acknowledgement, Roshan, my good friend, he has helped me in preparing every bits and pieces of this presentation. And also last but not the least, Mr. Ibrahim, who has helped me with all the facts and figures. Thank you. Thank you everybody for your patient hearing. Perfect timing, Torah.
you are Absolutely. right on time. So thank you very much for that. Okay. I'm, I'm sure that when you applied for the funding originally from Asia Connect prior to the pandemic even being known about, you, you would never have imagined that the, the program that you were applying for would turn into such a major project. So you were definitely a man in the right place at the right time. Yeah, probably God is the right man in the right place because it is not my credit. It is God, God's credit that they, he has come up with these blessings for me. Very and well. also, also thanks to Rene because without support from Nordonet, it was absurd. Of course. Okay, well, thank you again, Torrent. That was a great presentation and uh, very timely indeed. So our final talk today is from our good friend, Professor Francis Lee at uh, Nanyang Technical University. He's very well known to everybody everywhere in the entering community. Uh, so I won't take too much time to introduce his many uh, academic qualifications, uh, but Professor Lee is gonna talk about large da data transfers, which again has been something that has really grown in the last uh, couple of years with COVID in particular. So Francis, without any further ado, I'll hand over to you. The floor is yours. Thanks, Douglas. Um, and hi to all the friends and uh, colleagues out there. Let me share my screen. And um, I hope you all can, can see that. All right? Very good. OK. Um, I'm going to talk about large data transfer infrastructure and training for Asia Connect. Um, so let me go to the next slide, which gives you an overview of the whole project, the title. Uh, Professor Lawrence Wong and, and myself um, is the PI and co-PI of this project. It started back in 2020, and our intent was to build an infrastructure, a data transfer node infrastructure in the region, okay? Build a pool of communities, technical personnel, uh, who could manage them, okay? Um, and, and thirdly, to work with APRP, Asia Pacific Research Platform, uh, to promote awareness of the data transfer nodes. Um, you must remember our Asia region is actually quite far away from Europe and US, where a lot of um, our researchers are communicating with, and there's a lot of data uh, that we need to pull, uh, and also with our Oceania friends as well. Um, so the activities in the projects consist of procurement and setting up of data transfer nodes uh, at, in Indonesia, Philippines, Singapore, and, and Thailand. Uh, basically testing and prototyping the cluster, operate, operationalizing the, the prototypes, um, and training of a core team. In actual fact, it's a, a lot of one-to-one -one training uh, with uh, uh, researchers and uh, with the network people from Thailand, Philippines, and Indonesia. Uh, we also held training workshops um, in APAN 50, 51, and 52. Um, and we were about to hold training workshops for the domain users, we hope, by in APAN 53. Um, well, we're not sure whether it's going to be in person or not. <laughs> Sorry, we hope. If not, we will do it on virtually. Data transfer nodes are not something new. In actual fact, in the mid 20, um, you know, in 20, mid 20s, uh, 15, um, the things were coming up. And, and, and the reason for that is because people need to transfer more and more data. And they found that, hey, uh, I got a big pipe, but how come I cannot transfer and make full use of the data pipe? Okay. Uh, ESNet in US uh, um, Energy uh, Research Center um, were the first people that came up with the uh, Science DMZ. And an important component of the Science DMZ is the data transfer nodes, which is used for high speed transfer of data. Larisma took it out from ESNet and says, I think the universities and uh, needs it as well, and, and the research community needs it. And um, 
so in 2015, he, he applied for uh, funding from National Science Foundation and, and got the fund, uh, funding to uh, interconnect universities in California. It's called Big Data Freeway for Research. Uh, it's, it's Pacific Rim Platform, but the, the, the title of it is a Big Data Freeway for Research. But it's not only in US that things are happening. Things were also happening in Europe. Uh, they have a Work Package 6 DTN team. They're working on tuning the servers for, for the big data transfer nodes. Um, our bandwidth has gone from megabits to giga to hundreds of gig. So what is data transfer nodes? Very simplistically, it's a dedicated computer system for wide area data transfer. Yeah. Um, typically, Linux servers uh, with a high quality of components are not really all that expensive. I wouldn't, I mean, playing around with servers, uh, I wouldn't say it's really on the high end, but you need to know what, uh, what are some of the components you, you want. Uh, and then it runs software tools for high speed data transfer. Uh, some of the tools that we run uh, on top of it is uh, Persona Tools and Globus. Globus is just one example of it. It doesn't need to run Globus on top for the file transfer. Okay. Huh? Present it, Globus does present a secure unified interface um, for storage and transfer across multiple sites. And it's a single sign-on. It's also very nice. And its performance-wise is, is pretty good. So in our project, our deployment, our D DTN nodes uh, across the countries in, in our region. You look at our, our Asia Connect map, it, it gives me a great pride when I look at this because we started off with only a few links and now we have linked up to about 18 countries. Uh, that's really amazing. And, and that's due to the hard work of TN Star CC um, funding it, but also the the different communities in the end ranks in different countries coming forward uh, and, and making that work. That provides the connectivity. Let me show you this map um, down here. We have deployed DTN nodes in uh, Bangkok, Manila, Bandung, and Singapore. And in Singapore node, we, we actually um, have quite a big node here, partly because we have 100 gigs links, this dark purple links, all the way to US, to Europe, and to Oceania. So what we, what we can do is actually transfer data, example, NOAA data, to transit at uh, Singapore, and then on to Bandung, where they look at climate uh, prediction in the short term, now it's three, four days ahead. Um, so, that is our DTN deployment, very small. We ask for not much money, uh, but um, what we want to do is procure some servers, deploy them, and so that the researchers can work efficiently with them. Here's the uh, specs of the server that we procure not very high end, it's only got 12 cores, okay? Huh? You got RAM, a very pretty good amount of RAM. Um, the OS took up quite a bit, but not much. It's about half a tera. Um, NVMe, where we need a fast transit, we will use NVMe. Uh, and after that is a, a storage, and then basically hard disk drive, we got only a few tera, terabytes of data, uh, data storage in there. Uh, an important part is basically our NIC, our NIC cards. Uh, we did not go for 100 gig. Uh, we felt that the, although our pipes to US, Europe, and Oceania is 100 gig, uh, we don't need a 100 gig uh, uh, NIC card, you know, because once you go 100 gig, it's your software, your your hard disk drives and all those things comes into play. You may not even reach 
the 100 gig transfer rate. And, and here we got two, two ports, okay, and we got a rate controller inside it as well. Tuning, um, we did tuning on TCP, UDP, still use the same, uh, the NIC tuning, the packet, uh, the BIOS, we, we tune the BIOS, uh, the packet pacing, the intra binding involved in it, okay, the kernels and the this file systems. If you want to go at 100 gig, you really, really need to play around with the file systems a, a lot. Um, since ours is 10 gig, we are quite okay with that. We don't need to uh, play around too much with the file systems. Here are some results um, of transfer between uh, Singapore and US, ESNet, Sunnyvale. Um, if you don't tune it, you take about 12 um, minutes, or if you tune it, you take about five. So it's about two to two to three times the speed, you know, after you tune it. Uh, but if you really tune it well, like what we did here, um, because I was taking a team of students um, participating in a competition, and they need needed to transfer about 30 gig to 50 gig because they are singularity containers um, from Singapore all the way to Canada. We made use of the DTN nodes to speed up our transfers. Previously, it was if you don't use our DTN nodes, it was about hundreds of megabits per second. But when we use our, our DTN nodes, we get about three gigs throughput on that. And you can see those peaks going, going up very, very quickly. Okay, So that saved them a lot of time. And, pro and that time save um, helped them to try and do a lot more things during the competition. Um, they did very well. They came up second overall in, in, the, in the competition. Um, and this, this was one of the things that they were very, very happy with that we, we managed to have the DTN notes that really helped them out. Otherwise, it just takes too long for, for the transfers to go on. In our training and sharing activities, um, we was mainly in the APAN 50, 51, 52. Um, in our original project, we actually planned for it to be in person. Um, unfortunately, as you all know, uh, we couldn't do that. And so a lot of it was all virtual. In APAN 50, um, we basically ran uh, introduction to data transfer nodes and research platform technology. Here, we actually made use of AWS cloud services uh, to provide a, a, a training, a very basic training for, for people, uh, you know, about the, the DTN nodes and the research platform. And they were conducted by students, actually, um, two students, Jordan and Alex, and they were students um, doing their university final year. And um, Jordan was actually an intern in Singaran. But they were very fast and, and very, very good. And we communicated with John Hicks from uh, Internet2 um, to pick up the, the skills very, very quickly. And Simon Green, um, who has been playing around with DTN for, for a long, long time. In APAN 51, we felt that it was time that we break it up and have two focus. One was setting up and running Global's DTN and personal nodes. So that became a very focused uh, session by itself. And the other session was building a computational platform with Kubernetes. Kubernetes is something that has been adopted as uh, by the research platforms in, in US. And, and so it, it, it's very, very good. And we had a um, uh, um, sharing session here uh, from NAPAT as well, from uh, NECTEC. And we have about 59 attendants, attendees for this. And then we ran another similar workshop, but this time it was run by Pranoy on um, setting up and running Global's DTN. 
and persona nodes. So this was basically for um, net network and system people. Um, yeah. Uh, we run a competition. Um, or we, some of us, Lawrence and me, are involved in setting up a competition called Dave Data Mover Challenge, and that is basically DTN nodes, high-end DTN nodes that can pump close to uh, 90 gig traffic. It started in 2019, and this year we are still running it. And as you can see, we are running all the way to Europe, um, as well as to uh, US and Australia. So here, here you it's looking ahead. Um, what it, what are the um, technologies that can provide us with high data transfer? Because we're going to need it. Challenges encountered the impact of COVID was the procurement delay. Um, we were hit very badly. Uh, procurement was delayed tremendously and deployment was delayed tremendously because even when you procure it and deliver it, uh, the university may not allow the research staff to go back to help set it up. Uh, you know, so, so the deployment was also delayed quite badly. Uh, virtual meetings instead of in-person meeting. I think if there were an in-person meeting, I think uh, things would have moved much, much faster. Unfortunately, it can't be helped. Uh, engagement researchers also became quite difficult because of COVID. Uh, we also, asked, after some discussion with some researchers, we found that there was a need for other tools as well, like file sender uh, for sending large files. In Singaran, we deployed that, um, and it can send up to 50 gig of, of data when it's just sharing among one-to-one uh, -one sharing. And Singaran is uh, starting to rebuild the database mirror where we can copy maybe um, bioinformatic data all the way to, down to Singapore, and then people from around the region can copy out from Singapore. What's next? Um, well, Basuki has been the engaging session with the medical working group in Indonesia in, in November. I, I think uh, the few of us are moving out to engage the researchers uh, a lot, lot more. Charapont um, and us were talking to NICT and Professor Ken T. Murata uh, on possibility of deploying Kimawari 8 cache, which is basically a weather um, or satellite images. And from the satellite images, we can actually see how uh, the clouds are forming. And, and it, it was very, very interesting. And you can have it on your phone as well. Uh, you know, uh, Singaran itself uh, is engaging uh, researchers, asking them, what are the database that you need to copy down regularly uh, and use by your community? And we'll help to copy them down uh, into our database mirror service. Uh, climate prediction, uh, example of that was in Indonesia, uh, where we have short-term uh, weather prediction uh, using NOAA data. Um, other activities is that uh, the DTNs, we want to link our DTNs out to the DTNs in Europe and US, okay? Uh, I think that's important and also uh, engage them on the national research platforms on how the compute and storage uh, are developed and deployed. We also hope that there will be more DTN personal nodes in more countries in the region. Uh, that will really help in, in dis distributing out the data to the researchers. And supporting researchers via other data sharing tools. DTN is only one tool. There are other tools. So we are looking at how to share about the file sender and get that deployed in Indonesia, um, you know, so that they can also share that with their researchers. It's no use for us to build all this DTN network, nice network service, 
if the researchers cannot and or do not know how to use them. Thank you. And um, here are some of the people, if you want to know more about it, or you think you've got uh, a community that needs uh, to, or is transferring large amount of data and uh, needs some help, uh, we are more than uh, willing to uh, listen to you and, and see how we could assist you. Uh, we've got Basuki from Indonesia, Charapon in Thailand, and Bayani in Philippines. But you can be from, from anywhere, Laos, um, Malaysia, you know, we are more than happy. We are one big family. That's all I have, uh, Douglas. Very good. Thank you, Francis. And thank you for giving such a comprehensive coverage of that topic. I know it will be of a, a lot of interest and nice to bring in the American uh, link with our friends there as well. Um, so that brings I, I, that was there's a question from Brooks. What, why, what percentage of the traffic does a DTN consume? Um, it really depends on, 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 on how you tune it. Uh, currently, our, our DTN nodes are only 10 gig, but our pipes is 100 gig <laughs> pipes. So we are, we are not there. We currently can go up to about 8, 9 gigs easily. Thanks. Okay, well, thank you for that. And um, I was going to weave that into the panel session, but you've already answered <laughs> it, so well done. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. You're saving even more time. So that, that brings us to the end of the, uh, the presentation. So thank you to the three speakers. Um, as Francis has mentioned, there's been two or three, giving even more time. So that, that brings us to the end of the, uh, the presentation. So thank you to the three speakers. Um, as Francis has mentioned, there's been two or three questions that have been asked by people. So I thought I would just uh, address those in this, in this session now. Uh, so Francis, given that you have just finished and you were talking a little bit about that, was there anything you mentioned about file sender? Uh, Brooks asked about that. Was there anything else you wanted to cover in that question in particular? Uh, um, no, the file sender is another tool that maybe a lot of people don't realize that has been developed. Um, it's, you know, when we use our own mail system, uh, Microsoft mailing system and all those things, uh, we are limited by amount of file size we can transfer and research file size are large. Okay, so so what you need to have is as a server, set it up as a file sender server, and then that can act as the uh, your mail server in inverted commas for large files to transfer. And, and, and that was something that we we always say, okay, use DTN, but frankly speaking, you you must talk to the researcher and must understand their need. And, and through that, then you can uh, suggest uh, appropriate tools for, for that. Uh, just like data, data mirror, if a lot of people are downloading from NOAA, NOAA is going to be jammed up. You know, why don't we have one, one big uh, singer and pull down the, the data into Singapore and Southeast Asian region can have uh, access to it much faster, you know, um, because it's shorter latency instead of uh, going all the way to US and we're using the DTN nodes to, to pull things down much faster. Yeah. Well, that, well, that's certainly a good suggestion and maybe something that we can add to the list of things to uh, discuss either, either now or at some uh, later meeting. Um, so I just wanted to go around uh, and, and just address the other questions um, that have come up. So uh, this is one for Professor Wan. Uh, okay. Thank you for waiting so patiently there while the other speakers were talking. Um, so one question was talking about, um, as, as you may have seen, I'll, I'll just read it out. What percentage of traffic was analyzed because of the infrastructure limitations at BDREN, one of your partners? Um, was that um, able to be generated to protect non-monitored endpoints? So that's quite a specific sort of question. What, do you have an answer for that? Okay, uh, so first of all, I should say that uh, the information I have is secondhand. So I hope I'm reporting the results correctly because the uh, co PI or uh, co researcher involved with this is from Boat. So basically, the one of the uh, the issues that we face is that because this is a cloud and uh, cloud software, it's a virtual 
machine running on a cloud server and the cloud server is uh, part of the BD RAN infrastructure, uh, one of the challenges, of course, is depends on the capability of the server platform itself and the resources allocated to the, the, the cloud uh, image. So uh, often, I would say that a dedicated hardware device may probably be better at uh, servicing an entire institution uh, traffic. And I'm sure that the, the uh, vendors themselves also can scale and uh, configure the hardware uh, device in appropriate, uh, using appropriate uh, uh, accelerators and other, uh, uh, for example, customized the hardware uh, ASICs or something to support this kind of uh, monitoring in a much more efficient way. Having said that, uh, based on the, uh, on the uh, work that was done, uh, the CSS was used to protect the uh, BDRAN server segment. And uh, that a lot of it also depends on the amount of access to the BDRAN servers. So the, the data I have is that at the maximum, the bandwidth utilization is about 1.2 gigabits per second. Uh, it doesn't sound like much, but the, this is the peak uh, bandwidth because a lot depends on how much traffic is actually um, uh, directed towards the servers in, in, in that segment. And uh, the number of transactions, that the maximum number of transactions was about 730 transactions a second, which uh, equals to about 50 million transactions a day. And at the uh, maximum number of connections were about 33,000 connections uh, simultaneously. So I, I don't know if that helps in answering your question. Oh, well, I'm sure I'm sure Brooke will ask, ask another one if it's if it's not enough. Um, yeah, sure, I'd, no I'd like to ask you a more general question, if I could. Um, uh, the, the work that you have been doing around botnets and security in general. I mean, you, you've been so you've been working with the Asia Connect partners in this particular project. Yes, but obviously everybody across the Asia Connect region and of course the rest of the world is facing challenges from this area and the area that you're working in is very specific. Okay. You know, Francis is moving data. Everybody can understand that. Um, Torit is having Zoom sessions. Everybody can understand that at a general level. Yours is, yours is uh, a much newer, more sometimes more difficult thing to understand. Mm -hmm. How the work that you have been doing through this project, how can that be applied to NRENs generally across the region? Is that something that you have been able to take from your specific work to generalize to other people or other organizations as well? All right, thank you, uh, Douglas. Well, uh, first of all, we are still uh, developing the software. So one of the things that's happening is that we are seeking funding to uh, continue the project and developing the uh, analytics and uh, detection algorithms to be much more uh, responsive and be able to be uh, much more accurate. And uh, part of this also would be then to expand the number of participating institutions or NRENs to uh, contribute in terms of uh, data collection and, uh, and doing the analytics. Because the, the important uh, challenge about distributed botnets is that there's no centralized uh, botnet server. So it means that you cannot shut down the botnet by just you know, uh, black holing it or, you know, or even taking over the uh, hardware or assets of that botnet. Uh, they will spring up and continue operating from elsewhere. So the only thing you can do is to uh, determine the sources of the, uh, the, the host or the, or the infected host. And then for each NREN to take action to isolate them and then um, clean them uh, from the infections and so on. So that is uh, obviously uh, an ongoing uh, challenge because once we have uh, known botnets, then uh, there will be unknown or zero day uh, attacks that will be developed beyond that. So. Uh, in that sense, uh, what we would look for is uh, partners who are interested in participating in this uh, effort. And uh, the only challenge is that we need hardware because you need to have a packet capture server, an analytics server, uh, as well as access to a mirror port on the, on the switch, right? So that's the first thing. And secondly, I think uh, in order to uh, facilitate data exchange, 
uh, so far, currently in the project, we have signed NDAs with all the partners for data sharing. So uh, without that, we are not sure how much we can actually um, you know, exchange the data in a way that doesn't violate any national or um, uh, uh, data protection laws. That's one of the challenges that we face. So uh, for that reason, the data that we do uh, send to the, uh, file, the fireware uh, security dashboard is uh, anonymized, right? Uh, because we, we would not want to be responsible for any uh, data that is uh, that can identify specific users in within the particular country. Yeah, so yeah, we, it's an ongoing project. Uh, the PI who is going to continue this project is uh, one the member of my team in the USM. So if you're interested, you can uh, send me an email. The contact information was given earlier. I guess the uh, slides will probably be shared with the uh, attendees as well. So there are some uh, further details about the operation of the DBDS, which I did not present, but is part of this presentation slides. So any further questions, you're welcome to email me and I'll link you with the, the researcher who can answer best answer these questions. Thank you. Very good. Thank you for that comprehensive answer. So I've got a couple of questions for you, Torrit. So one um, also from Brooke, he was asking about the use of, you were, obviously this is to do with your licensing challenges and the massive increase that you had. So he was asking about um, why you use Zoom rather than possibly other uh, products that have maybe a better, better, licensing model like Jitsi Meet or EduMeet? What's the, what's the background to that question? That's a great question. Absolutely. That question was asked in upon 50 by Prasuti, I can remember. Uh, actually, we tried with Jitsi Meet and we tried with Big Blue Platon. Uh, Asif suggested me, Asif of Parn suggested me to use Big Blue Button. So we tried with those two software, but there are certain limitations using those softwares. The first thing is the bandwidth efficiency. Okay. The Zoom is highly bandwidth efficient. In our country, the bandwidth consumption matters because the network quality at the last mile is not that good. And the more bandwidth is consumed, it entails more cost. So you have to be very cautious the cost will be paid by the poor students. So you have to be very cautious in that respect. So Jitsumit and Big Blue, Big Blue Button, they are not that much efficient as Zoom is. The next thing is stability, okay? Jitsumit is nice. If you want to do a meeting within your corporation, or if you want to conduct four or five meetings a day, that is nice. But when you are, organizing thousands of meetings, if they don't become stable, your NOC will be bombarded with calls, questions, and emails. So the nicest thing is that we didn't face any single email or any single phone call in our NOC to attend. Hardly we used to receive any call that the Zoom is not working, okay? And sometimes with Jitsi Meet, the user needs to reset, needs to reconnect. He wants to share his screen, he cannot. Then he reconnects, then he can. Or his audio is not available. So he intentionally, he has to disconnect and then again, he needs to reconnect. So those are the issues. And some of the facilities like Zoom have, like break, breakout box, breakout room, so breakout room is an excellent facility for teachers to conduct different uh, types of tutorial classes. So those are the issues which made us uh, actually stick to Zoom. We couldn't right away shift from Zoom to other software applications because they had many limitations. Okay, that, that's a good answer. So I, I have another question for you, which is a question from me. 
Um, I know that you spent 20 years or more working in the telecommunications industry in Bangladesh. So you were working in, the, uh, in that sector before you got involved in the world of research networks. Uh, so obviously you're a very experienced man in that area. So I was interested in your comment that you could not get the telcos of Bangladesh to agree to give you free transit, because if there's anybody in Bangladesh who could make them agree to that, I would have thought that you were the man to do that. So do you, I'm sure you have lots of contacts in the industry and so on. So what, what was the real reason that they wouldn't do that in a, in a nutshell? Even, even with your experience and your knowledge of that particular sector, why would they not change their mind? That's a good question. So to answer your first part, that I was involved in telecom operators network. So I was involved with national telecom operator. And that was that is named as Teletalk Bangladesh Limited. So I could convince them. So I did my part. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but the problem is they had only 2% of the market share. So 98% belongs to other operators and they were private operators. So they were probably thinking of getting more money out of it, of out of uh, actually the taking leverage of this situation of this pandemic. Probably because of that reason, they didn't want to come at free of cost but they reduced the price and thanks to them that they could offer packages at 30% of their normal pricing. So we are thankful to them for that part. But right. we asked for full free of cost services that we failed to actually convince them. Uh, I don't think that you were alone in that. I'm sure that was a situation happening in telcos all around the world. So I'm sure that was a common one. So, but thank you for the answer. So I'm going to finish up with a final question to Francis. And uh, Francis, you've heard um, the, the, the sort of these conversations around the, a number of things this evening. Um, given your background and where you are, and you've, you've spoken about downloading Himawari data, you've heard Torit talk about things like centralized Zoom licensing or coverage over the internet versus hosting it on-prem and so on. Um, is there anything that you would like to just take a couple of minutes to talk about uh, that maybe for Tainstar CC and the wider community, what, what infrastructure do we need in the next, say, three to five years here in the Asia Pacific region that will enable the next leap forward for us as a community? That's, that's a big question. <laughs> you've got you've got two minutes. But okay. if I gave you if I gave you an hour, you would you would take it. But I'm going to give you two minutes so that you can think about what's important. Actually, um, Ten Star CC has done extremely well in terms of building the connectivity. I think the next phase is actually building the service, the service infrastructure, the Zoom service infrastructure, the DTN service infrastructure to enable people to do their job easier and, and, and take research one level up. Um, connectivity is done. It's almost a done deal, uh, you, know, uh, you know, but I have to be careful about it. I say almost because there are countries that need our help as well with the connectivity. But the next level of, of next step forward is service to provide the service to the greater community. Not just the network, it's the researchers that uses the network. That we must always remember. Although I'm a network engineer, but uh, you must think that the people that uses it uh, makes, makes the value of the network, grows the value of the network. I hope I haven't taken up too much of my time. <laughs> and I know. No, that's a, that's a good summary, and I think that's a good, um, a good point to finish on and a good reminder that uh, infrastructure is a problem. Like here in New Zealand, we like to say infrastructure is a problem that is easily solvable by money. You know, if you have enough money, you can always solve any infrastructure problem. 
But as Francis has said, changing how people are working and uh, the collaboration and having the knowledge and the skills to use that infrastructure, that's a much, that, that does require money, but it's a much longer process. Um, so yes, we are here on a long journey. So that will bring, that brings us to the end of the panel session and the speakers. I'd like to thank again our three speakers for um, their very interesting uh, presentations today. Uh, thank you, Lewis, for your remarks at the start. And uh, Yinjin, I will hand back to you to see if you have any other final words before we finish this evening. So thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Douglas, and also all speakers, Professor Mantachi, Dr. Tawid, and the Professor Francis Lee. For closing, I would like to invite Mr. Lewis again. Mr. Lewis, please close the session. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you for some another chance uh, to me. So I'd like to express uh, my gratitude, a gratitude to the uh, moderator and uh, speakers today. Uh, I think that uh, today's uh, webinar meeting, this presentation uh, was very meaningful and informative. I think that too. And so I hope uh, today's uh, webinar uh, will uh, be of great support and great help to all those who research and utilize our network, TAIN, or Asia Connect activities. And so on behalf of the TAIN Star CC, and TAIN Star CC will provide many users uh, through uh, such webinars and uh, will prepare a better quality and a better uh, quantity events uh, in the future. Uh, and so finally, so until the day we can see you in face-to-face -face meeting another chance, I wish you all the best of luck and the safety from variety pandemic situation. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thanks to all participants in this webinar. TENSRCC will continue this webinar series with the different topics. So we will announce the next webinar schedule and topic on the website and Facebook. Please follow Asia Connect web channels. We are looking forward to seeing you all again. See you at the next webinar in 2022. Thank you very much. Thank you.